any chat? Anyone? Hmm, I'm concerned that. <laughs> well, the, the, the comments are rolling in. Uh, oh, so you're seeing them. OK, well, that's great. I'm not, so I'm not sure why. So if you can see the comments, then go for it. If everyone's saying yes, it's a yes. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. Definitely, they can see it. OK, so uh, good afternoon or good evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, I, uh, it's, it's not morning in Hawaii anymore. So uh, my name is Guy Kawasaki. I'm the co-author of this book called APE. It stands for Author, Publisher, Entrepreneur. This is about uh, 20 or 25 minutes of content, and then we're going to have some q a successful self-published or what I call artisanal published author. So uh, I need to tell you a story first. Uh, two, actually three books ago I wrote a book called Enchantment. This is the cover of Enchantment. And as you heard it was a New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestseller. It was traditionally published by uh, Penguin, uh, the portfolio imprint of Penguin. And uh, to say, to put it mildly, uh, I had a very good arrangement with this company. Uh, you know, just everything you wanted. I had an agent. I had a large advance. You know, they provide copy editor, cover designer, you know, all the good stuff. Um, great publicists and all this kind of stuff. Uh, however, uh, I hit a little speed bump in my uh, marketing of this book. I, I gave a speech and part of the deal of the speech was that the client had to purchase 500 copies of the ebook version of Enchantment. And I thought, you know, just hallelujah, you know, how can it get any better of this? 500 copies of an ebook is basically pure profit because an ebook doesn't really cost anything. I mean, I guess you could make the case that it has some storage costs, but it's minuscule. And so I called up my publicist and said, you know, I have great news for you. I just sold 500 copies of the ebook version of Enchantment. And she said, well, that is great news. Uh, we don't sell ebooks directly. We have this uh, online reseller uh, agreement. And so uh, please tell the client to go buy it from Apple or Barnes and Noble or Amazon. And so the client goes and does that, and she tries Apple. Uh, she, she buys about 10 copies, and then Apple starts giving her an error message that she bought too many copies of a book, which, you know, that's kind of oxymoronic to me right there. How can you buy too many copies of an author's book? So she gets on the phone with Apple and explains that she needs to buy 500 and send them to 500 different people. And Apple said, <laughs> believe it or not, you need to buy them... Uh, 500 gift cards and scratch off the back, get the code, and then gift the card to 500 people one at a time. Well, that dog wasn't going to hunt. So she called up uh, Amazon and eventually she filled it using Kindle and she did it literally sending 500 emails to 500 recipients with 500 different promo codes that she bought one at a time. So if you look at her credit card statement that month she literally had 500 line items and when I heard that story I was just so amazed that that's what it took that it inspired me to write and publish my next book which was called what the plus and that book explained how to use Google Plus and in the process of writing Google Plus and publishing what the plus I learned that self-publishing is a non-trivial task I, I thought it was as simple as you know, writing it in Word, uploading it to Kindle and the iBookstore, and voila, you're in business. Well, that may be true for novelists, but it's certainly not true for a nonfiction writer who has things like pictures, captions, tables, lists, bulleted lists, numbered lists, footnotes, those kinds of things. And so that uh, inspired me to write Ape because I thought, in the words of Steve Jobs, surely there must be a better way. So, uh, now, having done both traditional publishing and self-publishing or artisanal publishing, um, I want to provide a little bit of information about how to choose. Uh, I'm going to give you the pros and cons of, of, of self-publishing. Um, so the first pro that I learned is, of course, you totally control the process. You control the process in terms of 
the content of the book, the cover of the book, the interior design of the book, the production of the book, the marketing of the book, and what caused this whole change in my attitude, the sales and marketing of the book. So with What the Plus, where I self-published, I sold a sponsorship of the book to Samsung. Um, I was giving away copies whenever I wanted to. I could cut you know, extremely low per unit deals for the electronic version. Uh, I could do all these kinds of things that I could never have done with a traditional publisher. So that is definitely one advantage. Second advantage is from the time that you tell Amazon, okay, uh, I've uploaded, go, you will find that you can start selling your book or Amazon can start selling your book in 48 hours maximum most likely 24 hours and uh, coming from the traditional world this was just eye-opening to me because in, in something like enchantment from the time I said it was done to the time it was on the shelf was about four to six months and of course the ebook version could have been there much earlier but traditional publishers make the ebook and the paper book go out at the same time so the ebook was basically sitting there for months waiting for the paper book to be you know printed so uh, a great advantage if you have a book that's extremely topical is from the time you say go to the time the book is for sale at Amazon or iBookstore is 48 hours or less and I think that that is rather remarkable uh, another pro is that you make much more money as an author of a book that you self publish uh, in the case of Ape which sells for $9.99 on Amazon um, the authors Sean Welch and I we make 70 percent of 9.99 so we make about seven dollars and to make seven dollars per copy of an ebook uh, believe me you won't make that kind of money through a traditional publisher so the advantages of self-publishing are total control of the process uh, quicker time to market and more lucrative the cons however is that there is no advance uh, you, you will not get any kind of advance because there's no entity advancing it to you um, and truth be told I think there are only two kinds of authors in the world um, one author wants a big advance and the other author lies um, everybody wants a big advance because with a big advance you know you hire a nanny you have a live-in maid you have tutors for your kids uh, you have your own home office, you have a Macintosh with a 27 inch screen, um, you know life is good with a big advance uh, so you're not going to get that advance. The second disadvantage is yes you gain total control but you also gain total responsibility so everything that a traditional publisher did for you you still have to do. It's not like when you self publish you don't have to copy edit, you don't have to design a cover, you don't have to design an interior, you don't have to do publicity. You have to do everything you had to do in the traditional world. It's just that now you are responsible for it. And there is a reason why you're making, or I'm making, or Sean and I are making seven dollars per copy. It's because we had to pay for the copy editing, the content editing, and all the other stuff that a traditional publisher would have absorbed. And finally, um, I have to tell you that self-publishing is often a lonely task uh, because before when you had a content editor assigned to you, um, among many of the other things that a content editor does, perhaps the most important, in fact, is to be your psychiatrist. And so uh, when you are self-publishing, you have to be your own psychiatrist. In a sense, you have to self-medicate. So it can get lonely as a self-published author. So the pros of self-publishing are control, time to market, and increased royalty. The cons are no advance, full responsibility, and loneliness. You could flip this chart and say, well, the, uh, the cons of traditional publishing are lack of control, longer time to market, and lower royalty. But the pros of traditional publishing is that um, you get a large advance, you're not responsible for as many things, and you have company when you write. Uh, when all the dust settles, I will tell you that uh, there's no doubt in my mind that the, the pros of self-publishing outweigh the cons of self-publishing. So that's how to choose. The next topic I want to discuss is how to write. Um, I think that many people have this impression of the writing life something along these lines. 
which is you're sitting on the veranda overlooking a windswept beach. You have a stack of parchment paper. The kids are asleep. They also are, by the way, straight A's. The house is clean. Everything is perfect in your life. You sit down on your veranda. There's your parchment. And the thoughts flow from your brain through your neck, through your shoulder through your tricep, through your bicep, through your forearm, to your fingertips. Your fingertips are grasping a Mont Blanc fountain pen with an 18 karat gold nib and the words flow out of your brain into the page. Then you take this beautifully handwritten cursive manuscript and you send it to an editor in New York and the editor in New York drops everything that he or she is doing and reads your manuscript immediately and calls you up a few hours later and tells you that, my God, in 30 years of editing books, I have never seen a manuscript that is perfect like the one you sent. So I just want to tell you, if, if you believe that this is how writing works, you are delusional. It is nothing like that at all. I, I think the two best metaphors for explaining how writing works are A, it is opening up a vein and pouring your blood onto a page. Uh, this is a metaphor attributed to about four or five different authors. It is a great metaphor. B, my metaphor. My metaphor is that writing is like throwing up. Throwing up. You are heaving. Sometimes it's dry heaves when you hit the writer's block. Other times you are really vomiting physical matter. It's a violent act. You're putting it out. And all, after all your vomit is out of your body, then you spend the next six to nine months refining the vomit, picking out the big chunks of food, editing your work. So between vomiting and bleeding, that's how writing is. And if you believe me, then you have to understand that how to write, there are right reasons to write and wrong reasons to write. So let's go through the wrong reasons first. The first wrong reason is because you believe it's going to be easy to make a lot of money. This is just not mathematically true. It is unlikely that you're going to make a ton of money with your book. This is not to say that you shouldn't write your book, but if, if, if this is the sole motivation for you to write your book, um, you need to get a little reality check. Second wrong reason, particularly for non-fiction non writers, is that by writing this book you'll be positioned as a thought leader and you'll get increased consulting fees. Third wrong reason is it'll increase your visibility, you'll be very popular in demand to make speeches at all kinds of great places and you'll be treated like royalty and you can have a contract that says you know you, you need special bottled water from Tibet gathered by monks and you need sky blue M&Ms and you need lavender towels in your bathroom and the hotel room has to have a north-south orientation because that's the orientation that works for your feng shui needs. Um, this too is not going to happen. These are the wrong reasons to write. The right reasons to write are first of all you have something to say that you want to enrich people's lives. Um, I think this by far is the best reason. You know you have to imagine that someone is at the Amazon website, the Apple website, the Barnes and Noble website, or they've gone to a to a Barnes and Noble bookstore, or if you're in Denver you go to the Tattered Cover, or if you're in Menlo Park you go to Kepler's, or you go to Book Passages in Marin County, and this great bookstore Powell's in, in uh, Portland. And then you have to imagine that you walk into this bookstore and there's your book. And your book is right next to a book by Hillary Clinton, her memoirs, uh, Isabel Allende, uh, Anne Lamott. Uh, if you're a mystery and thriller reader like me, it's Lee Child's book, and it's David Baldacci, and it's Tom Clancy. And you have to ask yourself, you know, why are people going to pick up your book when it's in such company? That is the $64 million question. And the answer is, is because it has to enrich people's lives. Uh, I think many people who write a book say, well, I'm going to write this book, it's going to make me money, it's going to increase consulting, increase speeches, it's going to make me a, a, a thought leader. Um, 
So I'm going to write The Schmo Way by Joe Schmo, published by Schmo Press. And I just want to disavow you of this kind of delusion. The reason to write a book is to enrich people's lives. You should think of a book as an end in itself. It's not a means to an end, and it is a piece of art. Second great reason is to further a cause. A uh, great example of this is, of course, Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. Her cause was the environment. And if you have this burning cause inside of you, uh, you need to get it out and write a book and help people understand this cause and further your cause with you. Uh, another great reason. And the third great reason is to meet an intellectual challenge, that writing a book is on the bucket list of your life. Uh, not because of the money again, but you want to just say that you write a, you wrote a book, that it, it was this great intellectual challenge. I think this is a beautiful reason to write a book also. Um, it's not marketing driven, it's not sales driven, it is just the challenge of writing a book. So this is how to write. You basically have to get the right reasons, enrich people's lives, further a cause, meet an intellectual challenge. Now, if you can check off one or more of the right reasons, then I have a recommendation for a book for you to read that will help you write. Um, this is a book called If You Want to Write. The author is Brenda Eulen. That is a quote by her. And I will tell you that this book changed my life. Uh, this book is about how people who didn't consider themselves a writer, who you know didn't have the trappings and the airs about themselves, but they and they were told that they were not a writer or they could not be a writer. Uh, and Brenda Eulen has written this beautiful book that empowers people to people to not listen to the naysayers and the, the skeptics and the pessimists. And basically she says, if you want to write, write. And don't care what people says, say. And uh, I read this about, oh God, 26 years ago. And this book literally changed my life. I read this book and it empowered me to become a writer. So, um, you know, when a writer tells you to read another author's book, there is no higher form of praise. So um, if you, just trust me on this. Trust the speaker here. You know, buy this book if you want to write by Brenda Eulen. Next topic is how to crowdsource. Um, I think I crowdsource a book more than any other author in the history of man. And the reason why I do this is because I have come to the conclusion that at any given point, there are a lot of people on the internet who know more about every subject in the world than you do. And so even if you're writing a book about self-publishing, there are people who know more about aspects of self-publishing than you do. And so the challenge is to find those people. And uh, I love the challenge. So I do it in three steps. The first step is I write a complete outline of a book. This takes me about two months, believe it or not. And I like to write the outline of a book because I think of writing a book as sort of a project. And as a project, think of it as an architectural project. In an architectural project, you design the plans. You draw up the plans before you lay concrete and pound nails. So the concept of writing a book without an outline, because it's, the thoughts are going to flow through your brain down to the parchment via the gold nip 18 karat uh, Mont Blanc pen is just totally foreign to me. I, I need to have an outline. And I would say this is true of a novel too. You need to have an outline. An architect and, uh, does not make a building ad hoc as you go. An architect lays it out right down to where every plug is in the building. So I do an outline. When I'm done with the outline, I put it in Google Docs because I want some place where everybody can see it. And then I send the message to my social media followers and I ask them, if they would like to have early input into my next book, go to this Google Doc and tell me what you think. Now, the Google Doc itself is not editable because when you tell a lot of followers to edit a Google Doc, if they all go and edit the Google Doc, it will be horrendous to figure out you know, what's important and what you should listen to and what you should ignore. So I lock the document so that nobody can edit it. The only way they can provide feedback is via comments in the social media post where I asked them to go get the doc. Okay, so I forced them back to Google Plus or Twitter or Facebook to provide me uh, feedback. 
So that's step one of crowdsourcing. Step two of crowdsourcing is now I'm in the manuscript stage. And there are two things I do here. Sometimes in the manuscript stage, I need an example. Uh, I like to put a lot of examples in my book. And so I'll give you a, a great example of this example. So uh, in APE, as, I, as you heard me say, uh, one of the great reasons to write a book is for the intellectual challenge. So I needed an example of a book that was written for an intellectual challenge. Now, that is not such an easy thing to find. You know, you can't exactly go to Google and say, uh, need book written for intellectual challenge. You know, I'm not sure the Google result would be so effective for that. So I posted a message uh, when I was in the manuscript stage to my social media groups. And I said, you know, does anybody know of a book that was written for the intellectual challenge? And somebody told me, you should look at this book called Gadsby, G-A-D-S-B-Y. This is a book that was written without using any words with the letter E in it, just as an intellectual challenge. And I thought that was such an off-the-wall example that that's what's in APE. I use that as an example of writing a book for the intellectual challenge. So that's one use of manuscript crowdsourcing. When the manuscript is more or less done, then I send a message to my social media followers and I say, all right, so would you like to copy and content edit the book? And this time I ask them to go to an online database area where they provide their name and, and contact information uh, because I need this so that when and if they actually send me comments, I need to put them in the acknowledgments and I need to send them a free copy. So I have them register in a database and just to give you an order of magnitude uh, uh, perspective into what can be done, at the time, I had a total of about 4 million followers. And of the 4 million followers, 250 said they would do this. I sent my Word manuscript to 250 total strangers. 60 of them sent back. Uh, this was a Word document with highlight comments turned on. So I asked them to type their comments directly into the, into the manuscript. And what I did is I would get back a manuscript. I would open the manuscript in one window. I would open my, you know, the Golden Master manuscript in another window. And I would just go through every correction and every suggestion they made uh, one by one, document by document. And uh, uh, if you decide to do this, uh, I have a power tip for you, which is don't send all the people who volunteer to do this the same version of the manuscript. You should stage it. And the reason why you stage it is, like, send, you know, 10 people the manuscript, wait till you get it back, make the corrections, and then send the next 10 people the manuscript. Because you don't want to send all people the same manuscript because then everybody is going to point out the same mistakes. And it'll get very boring to constantly see the same mistake being corrected. You want people to find new mistakes every time you revise the manuscript. So I got literally hundreds of copy editing, proof editing, content editing, and uh, suggestions on how to uh, improve the book. Then uh, at the final stage, when it was truly done, I sent another message to 4 million people saying, if you would like to review this book, I will let anybody who wants to review the book, review the book. Just give me your blog name, your blog address, the approximate number of page views you get per month. And I did that only to put up a little fence in front of people. The truth be known, I never checked those fields. I never read those fields. Anybody who said they wanted it, got it. Okay. Um, so about... Uh, about a thousand people said yes. I sent out a thousand copies of the manuscript. I also use NetGalley, which is a service where you can pay about $500 and they'll send an email to 66,000 people saying that uh, a manuscript is available for you to read. These are people who have registered as professional reviewers. So uh, I think another 500 or so people did it that way. So roughly speaking, 1,500 people provided information content, feedback, copy editing, proof editing, whatever you want. Uh, so in these three stages, roughly 1,500 people helped me. And that was a tremendous, tremendous help. Uh, and I, I'll tell you the next benefit of this is not only that you get a great book or a greater book, but you also get the ability to catalyze a lot of Amazon reviews very quickly. And so what happened is, on December 10th, Ape went for sale at midnight. 
the first time anybody could enter a review as opposed to pre-order the book was at midnight December 10th. And the reason why Amazon does this, of course, is if a book cannot be fulfilled, how can logically someone review it if they couldn't have bought it? So the moment you can order the book is the moment you can also review the book. Now, arguably, you could say Amazon should wait an hour so that people who bought the book immediately had an hour to read it. But they just turn it on and it goes, okay? So at 7 p.m. on December 9th, I sent an email to the 1,000 people uh, that I had seated personally with the PDF. And I said, in five hours, this book is going to go for sale. You can edit, I mean, you can um, comment for the first time at midnight. And it would be very helpful for me if you would go up there and comment immediately so that I can get a lot of comments up there, a lot of action as soon as the book goes up. And so that happened at 7 p.m. I woke up about eight hours later and there were roughly 50 reviews. Um, so in the first eight hours I had 50 reviews. And now, 90 days later, uh, I have 369 reviews. Of the 369 reviews, 311 are five star, 47 are four star, Below four star, three star, two star, and one star is a mere 11. So 11 out of 311 uh, people did not like the book. And I attribute this to two things. One is, knock on wood, I believe Charlie and I wrote a great book. But also I believe it was the seeding process. It was the crowdsource. And to crowdsource a book properly, you know, the most important thing is you have to trust people. If you went to a traditional publisher and said you're going to send out 1,500 copies of your manuscript to total strangers, they would have an aneurysm. They would not be able to cope with the thought that your manuscript is out there uh, with so little control because you know they're DRM freaks and that, that would just freak them out. So that's how to crowdsource. The last topic is how to build a platform, a marketing platform. A marketing platform is the hardest thing to do. It is also the most important thing to do. It is the longest thing to do. It probably will take you longer to build a marketing platform than it is to finish the book. And so my suggestion is the moment you start writing your book is the moment you start building a marketing platform. And I think critical mass is when you have about 5,000 people in total on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, LinkedIn, and Google+. Any combination you want, but magic number is about 5,000. And so I suggests what I call the NPR model. And the NPR model works like this. NPR provides great content all year long, right? Morning edition, all things considered, fresh air, uh, on point, talk of the nation, tech nation, all this kind of good stuff. Wait, wait, don't tell me. My absolute favorite show. All this good stuff. And so because they provide such good stuff, we don't mind that they run a telephone. You know, if most websites ran a telethon, there would be a riot that, you know, how dare you interrupt my listening with a telethon and market and try to make money from me. Um, there's such a feeling of entitlement by so, pe so many people on the Internet, but not when it comes to NPR. And that's because NPR has done something great for us. They've provided us Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me and Car Talk and Tech Nation all year long. So we feel a sense of gratitude towards NPR. And we may even feel so much gratitude that we actually give money to NPR. So that's the, the, the way I want you to approach um, building a market platform. Think like NPR. You are always providing something of value in your genre. Um, if you're a mystery and thriller writer and Wired Magazine runs an article about new kinds of, uh, new kinds of ways to destroy asteroids before they hit uh, the world, you know, post a link to that. If you are a, um, a cookbook author and you see a great recipe for making um, s'mores, you know, in a very unusual way or combining s'mores with brownies to make a new kind of dessert, it's not your recipe, but post that recipe. Just develop a reputation for posting great stuff that positioned you as a thought leader and as an expert in your particular genre so that when the day comes that you actually ship your book, people will think of you like NPR. This person provided me so much great content all year long. Now this person has written a book. 
this book must be good because that person was such a good curator and I really owe this person because this person has provided me such joy, such insight, such education for the whole year. Um, I should buy this person's book. So that is how to build a platform. And those are the topics that I wanted to cover today. Uh, the, the benefits, pros and cons of, of self-publishing, uh, how to write, uh, suggesting you buy if you want to write by Brenda Eulen, how to build a platform, and how to crowdsource. All of these are very necessary skills for successfully self-publishing a book. And uh, believe it or not, all of them are very low cost. So this is in 30 minutes uh, how to successfully publish a book and become a bestseller. Awesome. Thank you for all that, Guy. And I do, I, I said at the beginning we would take a few questions, and so I tried to cull what I think are some of okay. the strongest ones or maybe some of the ones that the people were most pressing about. Um, and this is sort of a huge topic, but I wonder if you could just address it lightly. The question of distribution, because it was coming up often as a self-published author, and, and your thoughts about yes. it and whether you feel like you've been barred from traditional bookstores particularly. Uh, uh, I am not a conspiracy theorist. But to tell you the truth, I've gone to the, to the extreme of limited distribution. So for the first 90 days, Ape was a Kindle Select book, which means that only Kindle sold it. Uh, there are advantages. They give you some marketing programs you cannot get if you're not a Kindle Select exclusive book. The Kindle Select exclusivity has expired. However, we have still not uh, distributed our book anywhere else. Uh, partially, or well, it's not partially, mostly it's because the people at Amazon and Kindle and CreateSpace have treated us so well that I kind of feel bad about going to the other online resellers. And so um, we have very limited distribution, i.e. Amazon. But I will tell you, limited distribution, i.e. Amazon, equals roughly 80% of the action anyway. So it's not that we're just nice people. Uh, we're not stupid. Uh, it's most of the action anyway. And um, we, I, I did learn a valuable lesson that as a nonfiction author to this day, enchantment paper outsells enchantment ebook roughly three or four to one. So I believe if you're a nonfiction author, you still have to go to paper. Uh, the way we went to paper with Ape is CreateSpace. CreateSpace is a print-on-demand part of Amazon, and you know just to give you an indication of how efficient that organization is, we got a uh, we 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 approved the proof on Christmas night, and on the 27th of December we had physical copies in our hand. That's how fast CreateSpace can print on demand, and uh, the, the CreateSpace cost for Ape, which is a 400-page book, is about five dollars and sixty cents, and it sells for uh, let's see. It sells for about the suggested retail is twenty five bucks. The street price is sixteen bucks. So you know we 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 probably make as much money on the printed paperback version of Ape as we do the ebook version of Ape, which is remarkable. Usually you make twice as much on the paperback version as the ebook version, but in this case we make a lot more than any other way we would with a traditional publisher. And it's true for both the paper and the ebook version. We also use Lightning Source. The reason why we use Lightning Source is we heard that some book retailers have such a, shall I say, attitude of anti Amazon that they will not buy books printed by CreateSpace because they know that CreateSpace is out of Amazon. So uh, we also use Lightning Source in case it is a political, psychological, or philosophical issue. Yeah, and that's true. A couple people were mentioning that, and it's actually true of Book Passage here in the Bay Area. They won't carry Create Space books, um, and I think it's a great service. But I actually think the paper quality is better at Lightning Source. So mm -hmm. just put that two cents in. And then okay. uh, let's see a couple more questions. I think so. They're wondering. A couple people are wondering what you think. How many eBooks do you have to sell to hit bestseller status? Um. Well, it depends on which bestseller status, right? Because 
a bestseller is such a vague term because you know the way Amazon does it, you could be you know trade, publishing, self-publishing, number one book. Does that make you a bestseller? I mean, if you if you slice something fine enough, you'll get to a point where you'll be a bestseller. Um, if if bestseller means New York Times, Wall Street Journal bestseller, uh, Ape was a Wall Street Journal ebook bestseller during a week when we sold about eight thousand. And I know that a New York Times nonfiction paper bestseller, the order of magnitude is 10,000 copies. So it's use 10,000 as a rough number. Okay, that's great. And then people are wondering about crowdsourcing fiction, and one person even mentioned poetry. I mean, is this something that you've heard of? Um, do they mean crowdsourcing the writing of it or crowdsourcing help for you writing it? I think just the way you were presenting crowdsourcing today, is that something you think you could do for fiction? Um, yes, I absolutely do, do believe that. I mean, you know, let, let's say that um, I was writing a science fiction thriller, right? And I would absolutely, I would absolutely, you know, have questions about the plot and I would say, well, you know, this... Does anybody know if you know if I say this uh, about how radioactivity will work, or you know, is it true that uh, an AK-47 you know jams this way or doesn't jam this way, or is it true that if, if this kind of um, if this kind of Air Force plane uh, could or could not be seen, and you know, are they really flying 10 feet above the land to be under the radar? You know, I'm, I'm sure there's all kinds of facts and stuff you would love to have fact check that you might not know and I guarantee you no matter what question you ask somebody on the internet knows the answer it's just remarkable to me how that's always true and we are making corrections to ape every month because of this some people point out better ways to do things and so we revise ape once a month that's awesome uh, uh, it's really interesting and then in terms of what you were talking about in the beginning, you know, the pros and cons of self-publishing, and you're someone who had a name before you went into this, and people were asking two questions, which I think are sort of one and the same. Do you have to have a name, and do you have to have an education? <laughs> you know. Well, well, listen. You know, um, did anybody know who Amy Hawking was before she wrote her book? Did anybody know? I don't even know her name today because I'm, you know, I'm not into sadomasochistic sex, so I don't even know who, what the author's name is of Fifty Shades of Grey. Did she have a name? Um, I don't get me wrong. It helps to have a name. Okay, it helps to have a pre-built marketing platform. But I would rather have a great book by someone with no name than a piece of crap by someone with a name, number one, and number two, from the as I said, from the time you decide to write a book to the time it's done is going to be a year, so you have a year to build your name from scratch, and it can be done. It's not easy, but it can be done. So to say that ape or self-publishing is only for people who already have a name is absolutely not true. Indeed, the, the whole assumption of Ape is that you don't have a name, you don't have experience, and I'm going to show you how to do this. Now, some people have said to me, you know, Guy, um, all of the things you wrote in Ape is true. If you had 4 million followers, you could do all this. But you know what? That's not how the book is written. So, you know, would they prefer someone write the book who has never self-published the book, never been traditionally published, has 50 followers on Twitter and Facebook, and that person, now you're going to read that person and, and believe his or her explanation for how to succeed? Absolutely not. So trust me when I tell you, this book is not written with the assumption that you have 4 million followers. Because if I wrote a book for people with 4 million followers, I would sell roughly 5 copies. And I don't want to sell 5 copies. I want to sell 5 million copies. Nice. Nice words to, <laughs> to end on, I think. And so I, um, I'm going to ask you to switch the control back over to me so that I can okay. tell people what we're giving tonight, what we're offering and, tonight. And if I if I may be so rude, 
Um, my son's lacrosse game starts in in 13 minutes, and it's their biggest rival. So I'm going to let you finish this off without me, okay? Awesome, and that's fine. And just so everybody knows, we're just going to take about three minutes to tell you how you can get more information from Guy. So uh, let's see. Thank you very Bye. much, everybody. And uh, whether you buy Ape or not, I hope you write a bestseller. All the best to you. Thanks. Hey, Guy. Yes. Uh, I think you did. You make me the presenter before you left. Um, I certainly said stop showing my screen. Yeah, so just over on the right-hand side where it says change presenter. Oh, maybe I can do it, actually. Let me see if I can do it myself. Well, when I click on oh, change yep. presenter, there is a list good. 300 people long. So, okay. Yeah, you can go. You can go. You're great. Okay. okay. Bye. Bye. Thanks so much. All right, everybody. I just want to take a couple of your minutes to let you know that you can get more of Guy if you liked what you heard tonight. He is going. He is making a special offer exclusive to She Writes Press to the She Writes community again, the Kawasaki series. So I just want to tell you really briefly what you're going to be getting. Um, and can you all see my screen? <laughs> Sorry to make you do that again. I just want to make sure. Um, here is what the offer is, week number one, how to publish a book. So he is going to go through writing for the right reasons, which he went into tonight. We'll ask him not to repeat for those of you who um, were here tonight, using the right tools, tapping into the crowd. You know, I'll, I'll ask him to do some specific things. I think a lot of people were asking how to hire a good copy editor, how to not spend too much for copy editing. I think there's some really interesting questions about this loneliness process, you know, how to partner with a team, how to get a great cover design. So this issue of recommendations on DIY versus hiring out. Um, and, you know, he has published an amazing book, a book that's done very well. And I think we can also talk about E versus print, which is another important topic. Uh, so that's Thursday next week, March 28th at 4 o'clock Pacific. Uh, and then the next one is how to market a book. And I think this for a lot of people is going to be the more compelling session. These are an hour each, with, totally with Guy, you know, his thing. Um, the most difficult part of creating a successful self-published book is the marketing. And so he's going to talk about all of these topics, why, mark, why writing and marketing need to be parallel processes. So we will get into platform on this call, how to promote your book. Um, a lot of you had questions about how to get traditionally reviewed. I think it's a really important one. Um, Social media, you know, Guy knows a ton about social media, and so he's going to tap into this topic, which I think is going to be fantastic. And then lastly, a little special portion here on Pinterest, which is all the rage. And if you're not using Pinterest already, there's some really fun ideas about specific ways to use Pinterest, you know, whether you're doing nonfiction or fiction. Uh, with registration, you get a couple fun things. One is Guy's book, uh, Ape. These are ebooks, so what we're basically going to do is give you uh, access code on Kindle to download the book, and or we can send you PDF files of the book if you don't have a Kindle app. So you know we'll find a way to deliver this to you in an effective way. But Guy's book, uh, which is a great book, my book, What's Your Book? A couple of you were asking about platform, and I have a chapter in my book about platform, and then a bonus free report from Penny Sansevieri and her Red Hot Publicity. Uh, Penny has been doing a lot of online publicity for Guy and has had really stellar results on some stuff for Guy. And so, you know, she's going to share some of those tips with all of you. Uh, and so we're wanting to give you all of this content if you sign up for the series, which is just a two-part series for $99. So it's a pretty amazing offer. I encourage you to go over to SheWritesPress.com, Kawasaki hyphen series, and sign up for $99, you'll get two full hours of Guy's knowledge plus uh, his book, my book, and the free report from Penny. And uh, we just want to thank you all so much for being on the call tonight and thank you for all of your good questions. Um, and oh, someone just said April 4th is a Sunday. <laughs> Uh, no, it's not. It's a Tuesday, so that's good. Uh, next month. So these are back-to-back -back Thursdays. And uh, again, thank you so much for all of you for being here, and we hope to be offering many more fun webinars to come. I hope you all have a wonderful evening, and take care.